it's it's not required, but if you would like to, to answer the survey, that would be great. And it's recorded, so um, it'll be available up on the web page uh, once we um, um, finish. It'll may probably not till tomorrow, but anyway, um, so that's available. And I don't think I really need to um, introduce Mark because um, he's, Everybody in Tulsa practically knows him. So, uh, and he just told me a while ago, if you weren't listening or if you weren't on a while ago, that he, he's got a bunch of photographs digitized from all of his visits to Tulsa. So we're going to have him send those to me and we'll get those put up and, and for people to look at and to reminisce. And uh, so, and and Mark, if people um, if um, people think of questions while in this session, can they just go ahead and put them in chat? Yeah, while, that'd be great. While we're talking, and uh, so Tessa will be monitoring chat, and uh, so whatever. So uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Mark, you said you had some questions that people had already sent to you. I do, and in the meantime, uh, Tessa has posted the link to the survey about how you heard over in the chat as well. So okay. you're welcome to, let's see, let's do this. Give me just a second. Okay. First question was, when will the 1950 census be released to the public? That's a great, we're waiting for it right now, right? But it's according to the quote 70, 72 year rule. Uh, and so it will be released to the public. It's always 72 years after the census day. So the 1850 census records will be released in April 2022. Now, what's different about the 50 census than when we got the 40 census back uh, not, not too many years ago now, um, that generally the Census Bureau releases them early to the commercial entity so they can start um, the, the indexing process. So I already know in, in the last meeting with a large group of folks at Family Search, the plan, so they'll be blending, uh, it, it'll be indexed much faster than it, we had the 40. There will be some participation of the, of the group indexing, but now they're using a lot, a lot better of an artificial intelligence feature it, I don't know if you've played with that, if you've been to Family Search lately, they actually have the ability now to uh, look at a handwritten document and do a, it, the AI does a transcription. It's amazing what it's capable of doing. So it's able to recognize names much better than people are, seems like. And then you have a person kind of watching over that. So it won't be too long uh, until uh, they'll be available. So I would anticipate that on April, uh, probably uh, that, depending on the day of the week, but that first week of April, we'll be able to access and view those directly. So not too long. And probably the indexes will be available much closer than they, we didn't have to wait too long, but you'll be able to go view uh, yourself or your family on that one. Okay. I know we're ready for it. Um, where's the best site to get 1830s era Canadian records such as Will's? Uh, this is a little harder question. Um, I have done some Canadian research, but not nearly as much as I do U.S. research. But really the best way, and I think the idea was how to get access to it um, as easy as possible without having to pay a big fee or that sort of thing. But the easiest way is to do it the, the way we always did the old stuff, to be honest with you, is to contact the provincial archives uh, in the province that, that you're looking for. And remember, those changed a little bit historically over time. And they have what they call a registry of wills. It works just like the same way as we contact a clerk in the US. So you, you, you contact the provincial archives for the time period that you're searching for and they will access it. However, that, that is the best way as far as the easy, one easy way to access it. Um, Family Search has most a uh, time period uh, of the early stuff available at familysearch.org. And the way to get to it, go to familysearch.org, click on search, 
come down to the catalog and then type under location or place Canada comma and the appropriate province. So I did Ontario as a, as a quick example here. And then I went down to probate records since you mentioned wills. And of course, look, here are the probate minute books from 1795 to 1847, the estate papers and the index. So there are some missing time periods, but they've got the record books available from 1795 through 1901 or through 1847. Um, and again, one of the things, if I click on that, let me just make a note. Those probate court records, uh, there's an index, the minutes. And so many of their stuff is recorded just like it would be in the States in a, in a probate record book. And most of these records, I say some, but uh, many of the Canadian records require you to access them at either a family history center or an affiliate library. And so remember the Tulsa Genealogy Center is an affiliate library. So um, easy way is to, is to go into the library, access them, and you'll be able to get in, into these series. I have tested them, so I know you'll be able to, it, to do it at an affiliate library. Um, one more thing, Tulsa Library also has the Ancestry Library Edition. It drives us crazy sometimes. I know it's a little different than the home, but the Ancestry Library Edition also has the a uh, large set of Canadian collection. It's included in the library edition. And it has the, the Drew In collection, which is massive. So if you're doing any kind of early US, uh, Missouri, Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, if you're doing anything early, um, that the, the Drew In collection has all of the French speaking stuff from uh, Quebec, et cetera. It's available at other libraries and archives, but the Drew In collection has the vital and church records from 1621 through 1967. And I've included the list of all the church records. It was not just Catholic churches. So the Anglican Church of Scotland, Evangelical, et cetera, large there, 14.5 million records. Now, most of these, because they're the Quebec area, are written in French but there's some Latin and Italian. And then the French Catholic church records uh, are available from 1747 as well. And then look at that part of that database number three. You may not know this exists. And particularly, again, if you're looking in the areas where things, uh, I know I've used it for Alabama and Arkansas, but uh, the very early, the, the pre-statehood stuff, the, the colonial time period, it's the earliest French Catholic parishes that are in the United States. And so, uh, again, most of them are in French or Latin, but they're accessible and they are available. Uh, they're available personally to your Ancestry account, but, but that you have to have the international version. But if you're using the uh, library edition, they are part of that collection. Um, there's three more databases I won't talk about specifically. But if you're interested, remember that the Drew In collection would be available to you uh, at the library as well. Okay. Kathy, have you ever accessed, I'm asking you a question, Wayne. Have you ever accessed that, that Drew In collection for anything um, yourself? I, I think too, sometime when you get a chance, you might just wanna go look at, uh, look at that collection because it's such a large database that if anybody comes into any area where there were French, you know, particularly Missouri, Arkansas, that early time period, it's very possible that those parish records are included in that collection. So if you everybody asked that question, remember you have it under the Drew in collection at Ancestry. I don't speak French. Well, but you can, but you, all you need to know is the basic, the basic terms. So Natal, you, you'll figure them out real quickly. So you can read a birth certificate in French, I'm sure. Um, the other thing is, folks, remember Ancestry is remote right now, so you can get it from home. So that's another good thing. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let me go into the next question. We'll move through these fairly quickly. Uh, it's a little tougher. This is a DNA question. Somebody said if a DNA result shows, and I'm just going to say any ancestor, any ethnic uh, ancestry estimate, 
what would be the best way to track that down? And you narrowed it down to a particular family. But let me remind you that the DNA S ethnicity percentages, they are an estimate based on reported ancestors. They're not actually calculated from the DNA. So the ethnicity estimates do not come from a calculation of um, centimorgans. They actually come from the report of individuals who they have, have they've built the database that their ancestry is this. So remember, that is an estimate that's based on what somebody reported. It's not based on a calculation of ethnicity. And, and certainly you guys know that because we can't track, uh, if you think about the difference between nationalities and ethnicity, um, a person is part of a given nation, but their ethnicity could be very different than the nationality where they are. So we're doing better at tracking that. But remember that, uh, but you can still track a family once you've determined who the possibility is. Let me kind of go on and answer it. Number one, focus on the, the individuals that you've identified as a potential area and then build a profile. So it's really important that you learn and, and try to identify as much as possible about the people that are the potential ancestors in that connection. Uh, unfortunately, if they're several generations back, and it sounds like they are, if we're trying to, we've narrowed it down to a group of people, let's say in the uh, even 1800 or, or 1750, if we back that far, you're, they're really too far back for you to match them any more directly with a DNA test because number one, um, the, the, the resulting autosomal test of anybody that were descendants of theirs might be helpful, but they may not be an exact match. And you probably know that from uh, the possibility. Also, always, if you're working in between that, let me suggest that you use this possibility tool. This is the favorite. I hope you can see that link at dnapainter.com. But it's actually, if you call, it's just called the DNA um, com uh, Comparability uh, Calculator or the index, the dnapainter.com. It's the first thing on that website. And you put in, for example, the Cinemorgans for somebody that you match in an autosomal test, that's what's on the left. It will then tell you based on that, what the percentage calculations are for the various relationships with you and that person. And, and there's a lot of possibilities, but the advantage of this is that a good DNA tester is going to look through that and then, and then look at all those possibilities and begin to rule them out. So for example, at an 80, um, an 80 Cinemorgan test, for example, that it's a possibility that person is a third cousin or a half second cousin once removed. You realize it gets a little bit more difficult, but depending upon that percentage, what you typically need to do is then work through all those possibilities and look at the paper, uh, the, the paper possibility, the, the paper reality of matching those. It's a little more complicated, but it's actually often worth the effort, but it does require a lot, a lot of effort on your part. Uh, at any point in time, you can get the, the, the chart on the, on the left just by clicking on uh, the documentation there on the right. And then it just tells you that based on the percentage, it shows you how it calculates those relationships. And those are, um, kind of kept up to date, they're, they're a little more accurate. And having used this to solve problems, this is a great tool to help you determine what are the possibilities of a relationship with this amount of DNA that we match. Now, I think, I think we always need this one, <laughs> or I do. We need to look at those ideas of problem solving. And I would suggest that going forward, any questions that you have, it's really important that you develop the sources that you trust and use them. Uh, and I keep a card file. I, I kind of call this my magic box. Uh, it's the information that I keep close at hand. It's, it's the links to the, uh, the databases that I use. It's the links to books or that I turn around. It's the references that I have. And it's always important to kind of, uh, as you go through your experience, build that network of good contacts. And I, I'm hoping that you guys involved here have a good relationship with the library. Don't forget the library. Uh, just because the library might not have a book you need, 
look at all the access that they have in their experience and answering questions. Because one of the great things about a good librarian is that they're used to dealing with questions. Um, didn't mean they, ha they, they happily want to answer all of them. They may not know the answer to every one of them, but they, they often know how to access some resources that will kind of help break down some of those points. And I think it's important to do that and never overlook or minimize the, the routine things you use all the time. The things that you keep your closest hand about your family often are where the answers are. We just have forgotten they were there. We don't read them very often. We don't look back on them. So remember, don't overlook the things that are right at your fingertips to answer a good question. By the way, Google is a great place to ask. So uh, again, uh, it, it's a way to narrow down the possibilities. And I'm, I expect all of you uh, to continue to be better researchers. And, and in response to that, I kind of think, you got to be confident that you're that you have an ability to learn. And we learn from each other. Every time I ever came to visit you guys, I learned so, a lot so much every day. Um, and and then in, in the correspondence that we've continued to have, even though we're not together, we do learn from that. So remember, we all have the ability to learn. I do try to practice being methodical, trying to be complete, not miss things when I'm looking at records and trying to use the appropriate techniques. And that, that's me. I need to always try to do the best, best things. I don't know about you, but I've got to learn to be a little more patient with my progress. I don't tend to be able to do things as quickly as I used to. I don't learn as fast. And I don't know about you, but I can't remember. I, I can't remember as many names as I used to off the top of my head. I can't remember even who's, who's what family I was working on. Sometimes I need to have more things in paper. And so I guess I make more mistakes. So with that, I think a good thing about being a researcher is look when you make a mistake, because we learn more from a mistake in reality than when we're successful, because we don't notice the difference. And always uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. Sometimes in the form of advice, sometimes that's uh, good serious advice to slow down and, and do it a little bit differently. And look at the training opportunities. And I appreciate the library giving us a chance to do this. And, and I, I totally appreciate and thank them for the chance to, for me to give you those, those five videos for you to watch at your leisure. In essence, that's a kind of training. If there's some that are helpful, watch them over and over again. And there's lots more out there. And they've been providing lots of stuff uh, in the time period that we're not able to get together. And, and that's the time to do it. Uh, give yourself a little bit of time every day or two, go watch part of something. One of the advantages of a videotape is you can stop it. So you can watch part of it and then go back to it later. So, okay. I got a couple more questions then we'll look at the ones that are in the chat, Kathy. Um, this, these are related directly. This, you people, I've decided that all of you all know some of the most interesting people in the world. It amazes me that this question came up and I thought, this can't be. So this person, I, I, I'm not sure if they're there or here or not. And if they are, they can let us know. But they may not want anybody to know. Uh, my uncle said he saw a famous outlaw named Fred Karpus. Uh, that may not mean anything to all of you. But when I saw Fred Karpus, I'm like, oh, my goodness. And they wanted to know, how can I find out more about, about Karpus? Um, if, if I said Jesse James, everybody's like, yeah, I know Jesse James. I know that story. But Fred Karpus is part of the, uh, the Ma Barker gang. So I know everybody's heard of Ma Barker and all her sons in that gang. That's who Fred Karpus is part of that gang. And um, he's one of the most well-known prisoners that was held at Alcatraz. <laughs> so so it's immediately, so here's your first shot. I'm going to give you a couple of places here. Uh, they've actually put together a whole website <laughs> on Francis. They called him Creepy, Creepy Carpus. Um, and he actually, he actually died in, I think, 1979. But he was part of the Barker gang in the 1930s. He was the last of the public enemies that the FBI put out, used to put out FBI public enemy. He was the last one that they ever captured when they were still doing the uh, calling them the public enemy. 
And so they've got a great series there. There's some photographs, some color photographs of him, and then some uh, uh, mug shots and a great discussion of his family. And then if you keep going, it goes on with pages and pages of the activity he was involved with. So that's AlcatrazHistory.com, Carpus. If you ever run across anybody that actually was at Alcatraz because it's now closed penitentiary, they've got great records there. And I talked about that, I know, in the big house and more, several of the Alca Alcatraz prisoners. Uh, but if you still search for them the same way, you'll find information. Now, on Carpus, one of the things with famous prisoners, now, not everybody you ever come up with might be famous. But it's always worth searching across Google. And Alvin, Alvin Karpis has a whole Wikipedia page. And, and I want to show you how to use Wikipedia to get to some good source information. So if you ever run across somebody and you look them up and they have a Wikipedia page, uh, the number one, scroll all the way down to the bottom. And there'll be a session that's called Reference and External Links. And so if there's been books written um, or if there's even other web pages that they cite from, you're going to see some titles of things there, other information. And if it's in blue, uh, for example, then you can move your mouse over it and click, and it'll, it'll often take you then to that page or that image. In addition, here's some external links uh, to go visit with more information on this person or on this subject. Uh, so that's always a good thing. And one of the my favorite ones of any of these people pursued by the FBI, the FBI now has taken their vault and all of the stuff, many of these things were requested by people in a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act. But over the years, they now have digitized these and actually full case files of uh, people that they chased in the 20s and 30s, et cetera, are actually on their website in the vault link. And so is, uh, so is Frank Carpus. So his, there's all the documents that the FBI had on him are also available and location and movement and capture. Uh, the guy who used to run, uh, the guy who used to run the Oklahoma State Penitentiary, he got involved. So evidently at one point in time, Frank Carpus was passing across, across the country and passing through Oklahoma. And the penitentiary guy was a friend of the FBI director, Jay, uh, anyway, Hoover. And so um, he called him up and they called uh, some troopers and they tried to capture uh, Carpus. It didn't happen, but he made the attempt. And I always thought that was a pretty interesting story that they were willing to work with people all across the country uh, trying to make these uh, captures. Okay. Okay, how would my how would I find my grandfather? Not my grandfather, my grandfather, W.O. Collins's brother, who Hubert, who worked for the USDA in the US register uh, that I mentioned in the session again on on the big house and more. And so if you go back in the handout, these links are all there. But I love this because this register of officers and agents that I mentioned, it, it was started to be published in 1816. And the great thing about this, I've only discovered it sometime last year, a listing of everybody ever employed by the federal government, including uh, uh, some contracting positions. And it's organized by the branches. And by branch, we're talking about executive, judicial, legislative, and then agencies, and there are agencies, federal agencies all over the country. And so including military commission officers are also often included in this. But in this case, to look up this individual, uh, there is a link in the handout that is Ancestry. And again, it's the U.S. Register of Civil, Military, and Naval Service. This one is a smaller subset. And in your handout, uh, I gave you uh, a list of all the ones that are available on Hadi Trust. Ancestry, uh, Google, etc. But I just chose this one quick as a, at a, a good attempt. And since we have the guy's name, you, you, you knew his name, all you've got to do is just type the name in there under first and last. Now, if you know a location, if he lived in a certain place, we could put it. 
where that A is. We could actually put a location there. Or if he was born in a state. One of the great things about these references is not only do they show where they were contracted or worked, but it actually showed where they were born. And you might not have thought about all the federal uh, documents would have indicated that, but that was important because they were typically civil service and it showed, it showed uh, the intent was to show that people were being hired all across the country, that there were people of every state working for the federal government. Okay, so his name was Hubert Collins. And if I type Hubert Collins, I get several hits. But uh, on the left, I've got the little red arrow pointing to Hubert L. Collins. He was working in Topeka, Kansas with the agricultural, uh, um, well, actually with the extension service, he was the ag st uh, statistician, which means he was tracking data for agricultural records for the university for USDA, US Department of Agriculture. He worked in several places, but you'll notice that uh, across from there, he was in Topeka. Uh, his legal residence is Kansas in the second congressional district. And it also indicates he was being paid $8,000 per year. So I just did a quick look for him. There are more records on those links about all of the jobs, but it, I pulled his obituary fairly quickly and it reported, I'm like, that's the right guy. He'd been a, a state ag a statistician for Kansas since 1935. So uh, the information that he reported, it didn't name his brother. So I could confirm that that was him, but I looked back at the family and this appears to be the same guy. Um, and that he was in his, uh, I found several obits in in papers around Kansas, et cetera, including the Wellsville area, Emporia, and Topeka. So uh, lots of good information. But if you look, it talks about he served in Washington, Illinois, and Colorado. And by looking at various years, if you wanted to know the years, just searching for this in Ancestry and then looking at the choices, then you could actually figure out, oh, okay, where he was in Colorado, where he was in Illinois. So it takes a little bit of effort but this is a great tool for us if you have anybody that was a contractor, worked for the federal government, et cetera. Okay. And I think this may be the last one of these and then we'll go to other ones. Where can I find older newspapers in different parts of the country? Uh, that's a good question. And, and we all wanna do it. Uh, use the commercial sites, certainly, and the ones that are available to the library. But when we get to older newspapers, I want to point out one thing. The first site here is Chron Chronicling America. That's the Library of Congress. And that, that if you go to that link, and I'll talk about AmericanAntiquarian.org just for a second. But Library of Congress is the site to go to first. And if you go to that link or just type Chronicling America, this is the page that will pop up. Now, you're apt to go look immediately at the digitized newspapers. That was not what the question asked. The question asked was, where do I find the older newspapers? And this red arrow is pointing to what's called the U.S. newspaper directory from 1690 to the present. And that's where you go to find out what is the listing of papers that's available. So number one, find out if there was a newspaper that ever existed. And that's the place to go. That's kind of what we used to call the old uh, National Union list of newspapers. So go to Chronicling America and then click on that tab. Now, you might also then go look to see if it's part of the digitized list that the Library of Congress has, or if it's available on one of the other sites. And there's a couple other places to do some searching, but the question was, how do I find what newspapers existed? And this is now the, the best place to go in regard to finding that. Uh, and then once you do it, you can actually then uh, search. You don't have to know the name of the paper. You can search by state, by county, and even with the cities. So it really it is really a great database to let you figure out what's available, uh, what survived. And sometimes there'll be some indication as where it's housed. And so some of these are not always housed uh, Library of Congress. They may not be digitized, but if you know it existed, then it makes it much better to find it. And then you can actually then uh, go search again on this free site. We already pay for this um, at 
the Library of Congress because they do have a large number of digitized newspapers and most of the state projects, for example, the Missouri State Historical Society that houses all of their digital papers for the state of Missouri, for example, they have, uh, they're connected and some of the states are cross connecting with uh, Library of Congress so that when you go through here, you're accessing, for example, all the ones that Missouri Historical also has available. They're all in that same large subset of newspapers. That'll keep you busy for a little while. And let me just mention for a second, the American Antiquarian Society uh, up in Worcester, Massachusetts, it is really the chief repository for newspapers that were published before 1850. And not only newspapers, but also uh, booklets. And that was, the collect, that was their intent, was to collect everything at that point prior to 1850. And so they have digital images for most of the things, books, pamphlets, literature, graphic arts, manuscripts, and newspapers uh, from all over the, the growing country and frontier. Um, it, it is connected to the site if the New England Historic Genealogical Society, um, that's a way to get into this, but go visit the American Antiquarian uh, to find out what they have and then, then, then you can work within them for individual process. You, they have institutions that have their collection, which is called American Historical Newspapers. So again, don't, don't sweat, it's available at some other libraries, et cetera. Uh, just gotta do a little bit of research. Let's see. Y'all asked good questions and made me want to go do some more work in regard to this. How might I find a family Bible from my family back in Virginia that was held by someone else? Now, that's the $64,000 question in it. How do I find that family Bible that I never knew existed? So I thought that was a good question. Well, I do have a process for that. Um, and I hope this might help in this case. I'm going to share a couple of three sites with you real quickly. Number one, uh, the Virginia Historical Society. And most families that are identified with Virginia Historical Society, they have a title called the Index of Bible Records on File. And this is an old card file that was in, um, in Richmond. And there's several, several films that existed. But the only thing about that, you can actually view the card file by going through family search, but you would have to be at the library. It has to be in an affiliate library or a history center, but I found a workaround. So bear with me just a second. If you go to this collection, there at the top, it is the Virginia Historical Society collection of Bibles from 1700 to 1900. So write this one down. It's not in, a, in your handout per se. It'll be in this, in this save uh, process here. And this is the way to get to all of those. So go to this collection. It's available from home. And you'll see the notation on this particular Bible page that that's Virginia Historical Society. And then their references for the Bible, they're written in pencil up on the top um, of this particular. So this is uh, marriage from a Bible in 1779. Now, this is what it looks like in family search. If you go to that collection, then on the left side, you'll see there are the Bibles and the transcriptions. You see how it says box number, and then it has the surname of the Bible. If you wanted to go look at that card file index that was at Virginia Historical, on the right side, once you get through all the box numbers, I think there's 71 box numbers, then you're gonna see card index. And then those are the surnames of the information that was included on a particular family Bible that had those surnames indexed. So if you want to go see the card file, you don't have to go through that first collection, go through this one, and then just scroll to the bottom of the list beyond the box 71, and find the card index. And then when it refers to the Bible, then back up to that Bible and you can actually see the actual Bible and or transcription uh, right there on family search from home. Okay. So I expect you guys to shut down Family Search today uh, looking for those Bibles. You'd be amazed what I've been able to find doing that. It included so many transcriptions that I found in archives and libraries. And that's typically how I search for things. And the other one I think you guys know, or these two hopefully you think about, 
when somebody has published a old family history book, whether it's good or not, look to see the family sources that are named. And so this is the Bevel Burton uh, book that was self-published in Austin, Texas. And notice here under family sources, the records of the James Bevel Bible listed in the Mississippi State Archives under the old WPA records of 1936. And then there's another one, the William Thomas Bev Bevel Bible published 1852, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The fact that somebody wrote about these and knew they existed in the reference, then today it's another place for me to go find that Bible. And often when somebody mentions it, that's that's sometimes it's much harder um, in one of these family sources to find where it's been passed and that sort of thing. So, you know, you kind of have to do all the above and certainly don't neglect searching the catalog at family search. Uh, go into keywords instead of searching for a collection, go into keywords and type family Bible. And then if you have a particular reference of a location that would be helpful. But often you're going to find where somebody has done a collection of files from various parts of the country or areas. And so that, that may be a, a good source for them to look for that book or that reference uh, to figure out more like, okay, that's, that's the Bible I'm looking for. So it could have moved from Virginia across to Kentucky uh, to somebody in Arkansas, maybe to Texas. And so you're going to have to figure out, well, where is it? And so hopefully somebody's written about it or shared it. Or let's hope perhaps that they may have uh, be a part of, I think, a large collection of good folks who've been collecting Bibles. And we can go to the, the uh, DAR website and we can search for references in their Bible records and transcriptions. And sometimes you'll cross over some of the same ones that are Virginia historical or in an archive somewhere. And then a reference been included in one of the transcriptions that's been collected uh, at the DAR library, et cetera. Okay, so that's all the people who asked me questions ahead of time. And I just pulled up one little series of pictures. Let me uh, close that and pull up the chat. Now, these are where there's hard questions, right? And I'm gonna put my glasses on so I can see these very good. <laughs> okay, uh, here's a question. If you have an ancestor who received land from the King of Eng England and President Jefferson, where would you find the land records? Okay, so I, you don't give me an exact time period, but I'm saying President Jefferson. That, so that puts it into, into that time period about the time that we are buying, um, that, we're, that we're buying the uh, Louisiana Purchase, et cetera. And so it, if the land, the question is not so much about who gave the land, but where the land is located. So the King of England would have had, would have had access to land. If we're talking about 1803, that's not going to be in the United States unless it's in one of the territorial areas beyond where, the, where that existed, which would be beyond the Louisiana Purchase somewhere or in the Canadian province. And so um, the best way to find where land came from is where the land is recorded. Where is the land lay? Um, and so if it's President Jefferson in that time period, generally um, we're either gonna find it in some of the congressional records uh, or we're going to find it in the Bureau of Land Management, which is already in place, establishing those uh, series of lands. If he gave it as a grant in, a, in the state of uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, um, what, any of the, the 13 colonies, those would be states by then when he's president. Those are going to be found in their land records, the 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 uh, president certainly can grant land if the federal government owns it in any of the states. So I would also consider looking in Jefferson's papers. Those are housed at the Library of Congress and those are indexed. Um, in regard to the King of England, that's the same thing. It's which king, so it's gonna be which time period. And for example, if it's King George and we're talking a grant of land in what would be the Carolina province, um, the best place to find that is where the land is located today. And so all of those original grants that were granted by the king 
or by the uh, by the crown protectors or or by the uh, the heaths and the people who were appointed for Carolina later. All of all of those things would be in probably the North Carolina State Archives is probably the best place to look. Uh, in fact, you're on here. Can you tell me where the do you mind coming on and telling me where the land the, the land would be just to make sure I'm focused on the right places? Ms. Beck. Okay. <laughs> or you can write it in the chat later. Okay. Oh, where would you find questions for Yo Yohogania County? Um, that's a stump. I would go look. So I don't recognize that unless that's a West Virginia County. I, there's one similar to that in name. If that's the case, my first choice is always uh, to go to Family Search, go to the catalog, not to the collections first, and then type uh, the state and county name and then see what records are available. That is always the best choice. Short of that, if that's a place that, uh, uh, that those records have not fully been digitized and they're available on microfilm, then at least I need to know that and that's the best place to find the catalog. Also, I would go to the state archives for any other county and determine if they have copies of records um, and or have made uh, uh, some digital access to some of the other records that aren't yet been transferred to Family Search, but in most cases, almost every state archives today has a cooperative agreement with Family Search, um, and such that anything that they make sure that they get that get copied and or digitized, they swap very quickly. Not every state, but most states. Uh, so that that's usually the the best place to do it. Okay. All right. Where is Jay? There's Jay. Jay, go right there. Uh, and you, you asked me that question like you, okay, but you're asking me because you want me to look from a Georgia perspective. Her question is, where can I get English names for Cherokee or Creek Native Americans who lived in Georgia before removal? Several descendants that live in Oklahoma, but going up the tree ends about the Civil War years. Um, and you asked me that, and I bet you, you know the answer. But anyway, I'm going to answer what, from my perspective, is that you're used to using the modern records that have been created in regard of the list, et cetera. And what you're going to have to do is go back to uh, uh, some of the records in, in the county records. So you're going to have to drop back almost prior to uh, removal would be in those counties that existed and the adjacent counties. And so you're gonna to have to fall back to depend on the county court order books, which are going to include such things as any land transfers. And remember, there may not be land transfers that survive in the area. So you're gonna to have to fall back to um, any requirements that would have been in place by the Oglethorpe colony, which would have been the early Georgia. Uh, then, then as the US, are we talking about just like 1830s? Or are we talking about 1780s? Uh, DAR has a question abroad asking for in Indian participants in the Revolutionary War. Okay. So I did it the hard way by looking at our local population, trying to move it backwards. Okay. I, got you. I, I can answer some of this. All right, go ahead, Kathy. Um, Jay, remember those books in Georgia that I showed you, those Don Shadburn books? He takes the Cherokees that were married to and, and had relationships with the whites. And remember I told you about the, the young man that while we were closed had emailed us and told us he had all these Cherokees and, you know, and anyway, his people had married the, all these white Georgians and the books were full of them. 
And so, I mean, we found all kinds of stuff for him. And it's his name is Don Shadburn. And I don't know if it's S H A D B O R N or B U R. Anyway, I can uh, we know, we can find them for you. There's about four or five of them. We've got all of them. But I mean, I would start there at least because yes, those... it, I just moved to the Cherokee question because following the creek sources uh, through the history of the earliest creek, uh, they were primarily neutral or involved with the right. Seminoles in Florida. So uh, I hit a dead end. And so I wanted to see where else. Well, the militia list are going, the militia list for that time period do exist, but you're going to have to, the problem is, it's matching the names to the later things. And, and I don't know that they're going to be identified any other more specifically. And that's what he's tried to do. I know there's a couple of folks trying to, to generate those, but as far as the records themselves, the militia lists are pretty extant and they're available in those county court order books and those, and the county militia books that are, that uh, most of those for, for Georgia are at the Georgia, Georgia State Archives. In I fact, doubt, though, that they're going to list Cherokees, Mark. Well, they do, because I just had that question come up, Kathy, they, they, and I sent it down there, and she told me it does include in the militia list, because uh, the militia list, if they include, if they came and joined the militia, then, then they, anyway, certain ones because they had a good working relationship. So I'm going to say not everybody. Kathy's probably right. Not everybody, but those that did because they got the, they got a reward. So in, in some cases, they paid a almost not really a bounty, but they paid a bounty for participating in the militia. So and they were promising. Remember, they were promising. You know, people promise a whole lot. They don't always pay out. And yeah. Georgia was really bad about promising uh, folks to serve that they would even have more chances at land and it was open to everybody so anyway yeah, land in Tennessee they're going to give them land in Tennessee <laughs> yeah, somewhere <laughs> else we're going to give you land somewhere else that's exactly exactly right uh, and and two I'm not sure that in every case if they were known by you know unless the, it, the, when they're saying English names too um you know, folks are going to be known by whatever name they're known in the community. They're not not like the government requiring them to what is your English name. So if they were known by another by a name that would have been what we would consider more a, a, a Creek or a Cherokee name, the militia list didn't care. Yeah. And na like Nancy Ward, she was not called Nancy Ward in <laughs> in the stuff. Right. In that early stuff. That's a good question. Jay always asks good questions. Can't quite, that's a good point. It's, it's that you're trying to find it in that process. And I don't know that it fully addresses the issue of what was the real situation there. And I know uh, Georgia has, has a thing called their, the Georgia Virtual Archives, Jay. And that's where they actually have large numbers of digital records by even by counties in addition. So I, I would suggest that you actually drop a note to one of the archivists at the Georgia State Archives of what your general question is and, and see if they haven't already addressed this in some way. Because they're they're really they seem to be on top of a lot. So okay, Kathy, the next question is going to be yours too. Gwen has a man uh, born in Germany in 1825 and he died in 1905 in Texas. Huh. What brought all those Germans to Texas, Kathy? Free land. What else? <laughs> no. Um, so they okay, so she said she's checked the county. That's where the naturalization would be if he was naturalized. Does it say on the nineteen hundred census that he's a naturalized citizen? Is that what you're telling me? Is Gwen here? And she might be on the. Yeah. Well, and also too, let me say, if she's not sure and you're looking for the land, go to the. Uh, 
Um, I think she's looking for the naturalization record. Oh, okay. Otherwise, I was going to say go to the General Land Office of Texas. And, you know, they have several of those uh, of the German groups who came collectively and they've got those classified at the GLO that way. But now, OK. The naturalization record. Go ahead, Kathy. Well, it would be at the county if for that early. I think she's trying to get on. Go ahead and unmute. Oh, it's the 1900 census states he immigrated from German in 1865 and has been naturalized, Kathy. Okay. Bastrop, Bastrop County. Okay, well, if it's not there, he could naturalize it any county. I mean, that's the whole, that's the problem. We, there's not an index for, but I would check, I would follow okay. him through. Okay, there, there, you're unmuted now. Okay, I, you can talk. Okay, uh, what I'm wanting to know is on 1900 census, he states he migrated from Germany and uh, he had been naturalized. And we never found him anywhere except in Texas. And all the places that he lived there, the counties, well, about three, we checked to see if they had the naturalization records. That's what we're after. Yeah. And, uh, that they just said no results. They sent it back, no results. Is there any place else to look for naturalization records? Well, the, the federal courts as well. So all the county courts, but also the federal courts, the district courts, if he was somewhere else. The odds are, though, look at the time period he came. If he came, if he migrated in 1865, um, then... And you don't find him on any other records either, even census records prior to that. Is that what you're saying? Did you find him on the census? Uh, yeah, we found him on census, yeah. Okay, I, the, the thing is, have y'all tried- He was a very educated man and he had a very unusual name, B-A-Y-A-N-S, excuse me, B-A-Y-A-N-S. So, um, since- well, I think I would check family search. I I don't think that I think that I would go to look at all the counties that he lived in and family search. Because the if he spoke German and went to, up to the courthouse to get naturalized, the people at the courthouse didn't speak German. And no telling how they butchered his name. Yeah, that's true. And so I would look at get get on family search. And look in Bastrop County and, and any of the other counties under their district court records and see if he's listed in the index. I mean, they may have butchered his name and that's why those people can't find him. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and two, depending on the group, there were there were quite a few groups coming from Germany to yeah, Texas. But not that, that late. Not well, I'm, but there's two sets there that are that time period. That's still there's still a group coming. And those and the GLO has just put those records up is what I'm saying. Just double check. In other words, her point, she's got to check everything and everything else. So <laughs> I think what Kathy said is the logical first step. But continue, continue to look for that. There were there were non groups. There were groups coming because of Texas land that were not affiliated. So uh, those records are going to be where where that association was. So if it was a German association, if you can read German, what about the German newspapers as well that are that are time period of coming in? Because you because at this point you just need a clue. I got that. Yeah. So hey, was he Lutheran or Catholic? Lutheran or Catholic? Oh I don't know that. Well do you know where he's buried? Uh, yeah, in um, where did I say? Is he in the city cemetery or a church cemetery? Um, I thought I had it on here. Okay, well, I'm just okay. going on, I'm just going on what my people, what happened to my people. And I mean, if you can find the church where he went, you won't, you, you'll know all about it. The, it's oh. all in the church records. Okay. Uh, so you need to identify if he's Lutheran or Catholic 
and then it'll tell you where he came from, the whole bit. Oh, okay. And uh, and then identify the church. So, um, what I can't remember what county Bastrop is in, but um, I, you know, I would try to do check and see if you could figure out if he's Lutheran or Catholic, and then go from there. All right. Thank you so much. I know lots of, lots of stuff there, but lots of directions, but not always the positive, you know, be, be uh, uh, I don't know, be open, be yeah. open I'm and, just and, and look in places that you just haven't looked before. You don't, you don't have to do anything. It's okay, girls. Picture up there. <laughs> Y'all want to, there she goes. I did. Hey, okay. Mark, uh, uh, Ms. Beck came back with Virginia. Okay, good. All right. I will address that again in just a second. Um, let me move through these a little. Okay. Liz asked, asked, wanted me to be concerned about, she thought the library edition and the home edition are the same. That answer is not, they're not the same. They have, uh, there's a different, the library edition is housed through um, a commercial company to Ancestry and the home edition has three options. You can have the U.S. records, you can have the international records, and then there is the Canadian set and library home, the library edition, <laughs> it's not called library, the library edition has both sets included in the North America and they're not included in the home edition. So to have the Drew in collection, for example, you have to have the full, the the all access or the international set. If you live in Canada, then they also have a Canadian record set that does not include the US. Okay, but, so I, I need to look at the library edition for some of the Canadian records that I'm not yeah. able to find. On yeah, and I, and I just got the update from ProQuest uh, this week. That the, the data I gave you about that, I just got this week, just well, last week. Okay, thank you. It's a little bit confusing sometimes. Yes. <laughs> I, I thought they were the same, except for the ability to build trees. Yeah, no, they're they're they they, they made that change at some point because there were large, massive collections that they made available to the that pro okay, pro quest made that the deal with Ancestry to make the Drew in, for example, and the full Canadian set part of the library edition, but it is not part of the home. It's not part of the home edition, hmm. unless you have all access. If you have all access or the international set, then you do, but. Oh, okay. Hey, Mark, have you heard whether they're gonna extend remote past the end of the year? Uh, no, I have not. I, I've heard the question asked, but I have not heard the answer. <laughs> but well, all of you out there, if you don't know, you can get in the library edition of Ancestry from home for free with your library card. You have to go in through the library webpage, tulsalibrary.org, and click on the databases and go in that way. But you can get it from home right now through the end of the year for free. So please everybody take advantage of that. I'm, we're hoping that they don't change it, but um, I mean, I know they're losing a lot of money, but they have been so generous all this time of COVID to make that available to, to all the library customers. But you have to have a library card and you have to go in through the library webpage. And if you need help with that, just call us or, or come out and we can show you. Okay, okay. I'll show you, Mark, go ahead. No, it's all right. Okay, let me go back to the question about the early uh, Jefferson giving land and or the king in Virginia. And again, the best place for that is going to be the record of that land. So if it's a crown grant or if it's uh, a state grant or it's a colonial reference all of those will be recorded if the land is in virginia they build they will be a there will be recorded and the copy of that will be in the in the earliest colonial land records and those are housed at the uh, 
Library of Virginia in Richmond. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm pretty sure most of those now are also available. Now that the the, uh, the very earliest stuff has has been digitized and has been open and available. And if you go look into Virginia land, you can actually look at the various types. There's there's about 20 different types of, of land, including crown, including presidential, including congressional land, and they have them all broken out by types. Uh, what used to be in the Library of Virginia, gosh. When we went, let me think about at some point in time, they used to have a card index file that now has been updated and it's current and it links directly to the documents. So library of LVA, uh, Library of Virginia is the shot there. I'm looking at Colonel William Russell from the Revolutionary War. Um, he was uh, coming out of Lee County, Virginia, and later got land in Kentucky, Virginia, uh, can, uh, uh, state of Kentucky. Okay. But he, also, but he also got land from uh, uh, the King of England. I think it was George. Uh, either he or his father did. Probably his, his, fa fa his father. Um, what would be the time period of that? Uh, I think that's early 1700s for his father. His father's name, I think, is Peter. Okay. So it's, it's going to be in the time period of the colony of Virginia before... Uh, so from 1660 through um, 1770, in that time period, it's going to still be in the land records of the colony of Virginia. Like the, um, uh, what is it, the uh, uh, Loyal Co uh, Land Company? Well, it depends. It could be part of the Loyal Land Company, and it could just be a crown grant. There are a lot of crown grants in Virginia in the early days. Okay. Remember, it is a Virginia... It is a British colony that is loyal to the king. So the king owns everything. So the loyal, the loyal Virginia company is one of the groups, but there are other, other groups that are coming. And, and the king gave property anywhere in the colonies. So it could even be in the Carolinas. So if you, I don't know where, where uh, Colonel Russell was living in the time period, but if you can, if you know where the land was when they either sold it, uh, gave it away, or lost it in a tax sale, then you can track you can track that property back to its the original grant because it will be named. It was a gift from King George. Da, 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 da. Do I need to look on both sides of the um, both? Uh, no, just the U.S. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. You you could, but there's no point. It will be recorded that way because if it's a gift from the crown, trust me, it's going to say it. <laughs> it's going to be really clear. Now, if you okay. know where he was living and you know where part of the land was, go back and follow the early colonial tax list, and then just follow the each piece of property back in its in its record. And in the early stuff that was done is is the crown stuff is all still recorded in the colonial time periods. So. Uh, uh, can't think of the guy's name. Starts with an H, Kathy. That um, is it, Heine. Um, that records all that colonial, the colonial stuff. But go Hennings. to the Hennings. Henning, Henning. Uh, sometimes it will be included in in Henning's uh, references. But if you'll go back to the Library of Virginia and look for the earliest land stuff, they explain it very thoroughly on their website. And we have the Henning stuff if you need that, too. And it's online, too, at the Library of Virginia okay. now. So Okay, good. Thank you okay. so much. Good luck on that. Um, okay, Karen wants to find a map of the travel route in 1837 from the county courthouse in Sumner County to Simpson County, Kentucky. The families, they were married in Tennessee, but say they were born in Kentucky, and the census records show Simpson County. In 1837, there must have been a reason to go to Tennessee rather than the county courthouse for Kentucky. What map route would I use for travel routes in that time period? Well, I'd probably use a map from um, David Rumsey, but Simpson County touches, Simpson County touches uh, Sumner County and the route 
the route from, if you look at highway today, if you'll look at highway uh, 109, so look at a modern roadmap, look at US at, at, at road number 109 that runs from Portland to Gallatin. And then if you'll look at Franklin, Franklin is Simpson County and any of the routes there, but to go directly to the courthouse would have been highway 109. Uh, they would not have had to go to the courthouse in Sumner County. All they had to do in 1837 was cross the state line. They probably married in Mitchellville, which is right on the Tennessee, right on the Tennessee Kentucky border. I, I know that Karen, because my grandparents did exactly the same thing. Now they came a little bit later, uh, but it was very common. Kentucky at, in 1837 required a full bond. Uh, and required, and, and sometimes required a waiting period. In 1837, there probably wasn't a waiting period. But the reason that they did it is that it was cheaper. It, it only cost 50 cents. Um, and in Kentucky, I think they were charging uh, maybe 75 cents or a dollar. We're so we're not talking lots of money, but we're talking a little bit of money. But in reality, it was still simpler. You, if you watched uh, the time period of going to a JP, that's all they had to do in 37. All they had to do was just cross the state line, go to Mitchellville. The JP there was well set up. They go, they pay him the 50 cents. He married them. They could go back home. So as far as a road, uh, that, that road is the same road today as it's been forever. And that there's two roads that come together there. Uh, one is called the route to Cairo, and that's not to Egypt. That's to, that's to Gallatin, and then on east, it goes on toward Knoxville. And the Louisville and Nashville uh, stage route, which would be the Louisville to Nashville, that goes right through the same point we're talking about there at Franklin. Uh, and so it wouldn't be hard to find those roads on any of the, uh, um, the maps uh, in that time period. So... Um, and, and if you look to see who the JP was, or if it was a minister, they were both in Mitchellville. I'll bet we would figure out that it was probably a J, JP in the town of Mitchellville. And they just crossed the state line. They didn't go all the way to Gallatin. Now, it would have been recorded in Gallatin, but the JP could have processed it, and then he would have transferred it. Uh, we did not, in 1837, by the way, Tennessee did not require marriages to be written into a bound book until 1838, the next year. So sometimes um, we have the loose records and Sumner County does have those, but they were not written into bound books by law until 1838. So you're lucky that it survives. Many of them don't uh, in that process. It probably was done by JP. Okay. Okay, let me um, let me share uh, some links here, and give me just a second because several of you are asking. And by the way, there's not a handout for the Q and A. Uh, these have just been things that came up um, in regard to your questions. And so, all the handouts I think Tessa and uh, some of them already posted. Those are available on the uh, uh, library's website. And I'm gonna post this, this collect uh, information from the family search. These are the links of the family Bible collection. Those links that I mentioned at family search, those are not in a handout somewhere. And so if you're interested in those, I'm going to post those real quickly right now. Let's see. There, I've just posted it in the, uh, and I will post the. Okay. Let me go back to Ms. Beck for a second. Uh, if he received land in Kentucky, uh, that that's later, definitely. And and again, those the the uh, grants uh, are what they would call the patents for land. Those are at the Library of Virginia. 
But there's been a, a book that's available at the library there in Tulsa by Willard Gilson. Um, and that's uh, J-I-L-L-S-O-N. He was the state geologist or geographer of Kentucky. And he published what's called Kentucky Land Grants. Um, now, the copies of those Virginia grants and the later Kentucky grants are all available at the Kentucky Secretary of State at the Land Office up in Frankfurt. And uh, they have a database. So Kentucky Secretary of State Land Office, Kentucky Land Office. Um, and, and you can search for those there. And so they actually have links uh, to those patents as well. Thank you. Oh, um, hey, Tessa, I think I direct sent that to you or to Kathy. Uh, it didn't post to the uh, public. That's my fault. Let me try. Oh. Let's try this again. Okay, did everybody just get one link from me? Yeah, that came out that time. Okay, I just posted it evidently privately. I didn't realize it. Okay, and that one you probably know, but that's the DAR link to their Bible records. Uh, okay, Liz asked me a question about my opinion. <laughs> you don't really want my opinion, Liz, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, of WikiTree and GennyCom, uh, or, uh, I know you need to take them with a grain of salt, but I found some interesting trees. I've used them both extensively. I am not opposed to using tools. Uh, and you know me, I don't believe in turning my nose up at any information, whether it's right or wrong. So I think the fact is we've accepted, when I started doing research, let me explain, and Liz knows this, but when I started researching when I was a kid, what was available to me in libraries were clippings files. And we accepted those as such wonderful pieces of information because people would go in the library and they make copies of their family group sheets and they make copies of stuff and they would put in the library, would make those available. And when I was a kid, I would go into those and I accepted most of those things as, as being from good researchers. It didn't take me very long to realize there was information in there that was incorrect and that people sometimes are sloppy in their research and collection. Um, and so, but there was some great stuff in there too. So I think you as the researcher have to be the filter. And so you've got to determine, is this correct? Is this helpful? Uh, is it going to get me further down, down the line? If we're stuck in a situation, I think it's okay to look at everything. And I don't, I do, I, I don't keep anything from my midst. And uh, if I, I know there are people who are fairly renowned researchers and I trust them as well, but I, we all make mistakes. Yeah. And and so I think we we always have to be just a little bit cautious, <laughs> a little bit cautious. I'm always cautious of stuff that I use that I that I wrote long ago. Sometimes I look at stuff and I think, "Ooh, I was really good that day. That day I was really good. Uh, and it'd be another thing. And, and I think I may not be. So don't be afraid of using a uh, anything that out there that's information. And trust me, there's so much stuff on the Internet that should be taken with a grain of salt, maybe not a grain of salt with a whole shaker full of salt. <laughs> um, but still, if it helps, if it helps in those times of mulling and pondering and it gives you a new thought, then definitely go that direction. Well, I've just found some things um, just kind of playing around that I wasn't <laughs> even looking for. Um, I'm apparently connected to, and, and I've verified most of this line. I'm a descendant of um, the grandfather of Thomas Jefferson, um, Rand Randolph. I forget, uh, I forget what his first name is. Um, 
And I've been able to verify that line, but that wasn't something I was looking for. It just kind of popped up. And so it was just kind of a fun activity Mm -hmm. and you don't, um, I just hadn't seen many people, um, you know, talk about those sites, wikitree and and genie.com. And I think there, there is some good information, but you know, like we said, you got to verify it all. Well, uh, and, and Bobby, uh, Bobby made a point in the, in the chat. I would agree. She said, Tom Jones reminds us, don't be a source snob. Uh, right. I used, I used uh, one of the, one of the, uh, oh, I have used those in almost every TV show I've looked at where we're looking for collateral ancestors. Mm-hmm. And I used uh, uh, Jenny.com directly in the group uh Oh, I can't think of her, her name that, that kind of did that. You remember that big family reunion that we had uh, connected with the FGS conference several years ago. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the main people who, who involved that was one of the people at, at genie.com who began to help trying to put like, you know, that big world family tree kind of process together uh, in that one as well. And so I find good stuff. One of the great things is when you find somebody who's really very precise in their records and they, what I really love is when I actually find out not only the date somebody died, but they actually tell me the County and the reference to their will book and page number. So you find that sometimes within that material and other times you find that it came from, it's just a general date. So uh, anytime somebody gives me a specific date, I kind of need to know where that date comes from. Right. Um, and and if if somebody's not good at giving me that, particularly particularly if it's a date, um, you know, if, if they say so and so was born the fifth of May, sixteen ninety, I need to know where that came from. Mm-hmm. And and if I don't have it, then I, then my next step is to figure out where. And often. I'll just ask. And if they don't, and they'll say, Oh, it just came from somewhere. So. Okay. Uh, uh, Karen, they, they were required. Okay. Karen's asked me another good Tennessee question. This one I can answer. Um, Sunder County, Tennessee clerk was Thomas uh, Donahoe that, that know that name. Uh, the issue, he issued a license that said any minister or JP could marry them as they had given security. Uh, you're saying it sounds like they put up a bond. Actually, they didn't have to put up a bond. They just had to sign a bond. So a security bond does not necessarily, there's some confusion about the term bond. In Tennessee law, to put up a bond, what you do is bond the governor that you're able to marry. It does not require a cash bond. Okay. Um, and, and unfortunately in that time period, the bond in Tennessee is not like a bond in the Kentucky bond. You wish they had married in their home state, by the way, because the Kentucky bond required a listing of the parents of the bride and the groom and the number of their marriage. Tennessee law did not. So it, there's, (laughs) unfortunately, Tennessee law at that time, uh, did not require even any more application. So that's probably all that's there. Uh, if he indicated uh, a, if there was a return, uh, and, and that would have been in the time period of the book, they added the, the minister's return in the book, that might be. I would tell you, as far as looking anywhere else, um, the balance of what's available in that time period has been moved to the Tennessee State Library and Archives. There is an archives in Sumner County, but that early stuff is now, look at the the county records for the Tennessee State Library and Archives, and then uh, look under Sumner County and look at the early stuff and and see if there's anything else. But you're kind of in that time period before we had the books, when everything's kind of loose and up in the air in Tennessee. So it's really, I'm, I'm not not sure um, if if the uh, because what you have is the license and that would have worked even though Thomas Donahue is the clerk the JP up in um, Mitchellville 
would have collected the money and take it, taken it to Donahue, and he would have written the very same document. So there's no no difference in the in, in the document. It's it would whether he bought it here or somewhere else, unfortunately. Okay, and also um, she's put up a link to the survey. If anybody had any problems, she's got an updated link so that you can tell them how you learned and heard about stuff. So, Kathy, I think we're caught up on questions at the moment, unless. And she may have gone to take care of something, so. No, I'm here. <laughs> okay, can I ask one then? Uh, maybe. Go ahead. So it's a lot about kind of what you were just talking about. So what do you do? Because I listened to your um, session on, you know, the um, history, county history books and the oh, yeah. records and the information in those. Well, this isn't from a county history book, but multiple books about this particular couple tell me the exact marriage date. They do not know where it is. They, they know her maiden name, but they don't know where she's from and they don't know who her parents are. And what has happened is somebody, every book about this situation has been, just copied the same information over and over. Right. And um, so I have looked on Family Search and uh, found the earliest, even though they say they married in 1759, I think it is. Um, they say she's from Surrey County and a prominent, from a prominent family, but they don't know any, her family. Are we, Surrey County, North Carolina or Virginia? No, Virginia. Okay. And they, but, but then they go to Mecklenburg County and I have found a deed in Mecklenburg County. North Carolina? No, Virginia. Virginia. Okay. No, not, they do go to North Carolina, but that's after <laughs> 1800, forget that. Okay. Uh, I, I got them in uh, North Carolina, that's easy. But, um, but, uh, but the, I found the, the, uh, the deed record in Mecklenburg County in the 1780s but before that they're not mentioned in in i i looked on family search for in both mecklenburg county and surrey county and cannot find a marriage uh but the reason i thought about this when you were talking about your um uh county history books is because you were talking about you just mentioned and I thought, well, maybe this is a possibility. You just mentioned that the circuit riders would record stuff and then give it to whatever county they lived in or whatever. So my question is, if that's a possibility, how do you find out, A, who the circuit riders were at that time period, and B, what counties they were from? Well, circuit riders, okay, are a little bit later than this, for one thing, but... Uh, circuit riders are usually are primarily known and identified as Methodist. Well, they were Methodist because he turned out to be a Methodist minister later. Yeah, like yeah, a little later. Okay, um, so all you do is you look at the conference minutes for the state, and the conference minutes every year identify. Who are the who who are identified as the ministers for the circuits and the circuits are named in the state every year the state conference for the Methodist Church would name the circuit would name the, the ministers for the circuits and the circuits are listed. I don't think the minutes go back to the 18th to the 1750s. No, no they don't. That's what I'm saying. They don't go back to that point because they're not circuit writing yet. It's going to be a little later. It's a little later than that. I see. I see. So, I see so, what you're, so you're actually prior prior to that time period. Um, well, but, I mean, I don't know when it is. That's just the date. That, I mean, they it, June okay. of something. Here's what you need to work in those counties you named. You know, they married in 1759. I think it. I think it's 59 or 57. And okay, either and, year. Okay. 
either year, then what you're going to do is you're going to use the tax list, the county tax list for those counties looking for that surname and that person. Is he, is he of age when he marries? Should he be? Well, you know other things about him. Should he be of age? Is he, is he 21? He should be, yes. Okay, so he's going to already appear either with property tax list or personal property list in Virginia. Virginia has the best, the best tax list with, with very little missing area. There are some missing areas, but they're not complete. So when people say, oh, it's a burn county, it doesn't mean that everything is missing. That's your best shot is to use a tax list. Once you find him, then, then you can you know what her father's name probably is too. You're not sure. You said it wasn't identified. Or don't, you don't even know her maiden name. Is that yes, what you're they saying? Know, they know her maiden name, which is weird. But they, and they say she's from a prominent family, but they don't know who her parents are. Okay. So then I would do the same thing. I would identify the people of that name in, in and around those counties. And then with that, then I would look, I would then cross over. Now, there are, there are some early Methodist publications for the Methodist church for Virginia. Um, I uh, contacted the library of Virginia because yeah. this person, uh, the, he was a minister in Virginia before he was a minister in North Carolina. And they they looked for me at, for any kind of, I'm trying to find his, they say that he was, he was licensed in the 1770s, okay. but, but they don't have it. I mean, they can't find it. Okay. That's the wrong place to have that information. Unfortunately too, they, they could look, but there's a book by, by Nathan Bangs. What was the last name? I'm going to type it. I'm going to type it. Nathan Nathan Bangs. B A N G S. Okay. And uh, the title and the title of something is the history of the Methodist Church from 1715 forward or that kind of thing. I probably already have seen this. He's got multiple editions in the appendix. He has an appendix of all of the um, uh, all of the ministers, and it has been it has been annotated and updated, and based on the Methodist Church, if if somebody's in there and licensed, uh, it could be a different group that's not part of the Methodist Church established at the time period. It's considered the most comprehensive list of, and it has the dates. It has the dates by years in the appendix of okay. licensures. I think I've got a copy of that. You might know there's more than one. So there are multiple editions and, and both or three of them are all online on Google Books and Hottie Trust as well. Okay. If you don't find them in one, check the other one as well, just to be sure. Okay. But if you're go if you're gonna find that, when did the man die? By the way, 1826. Was he still a minister then? No, he, he broke away. It's it's James O'Kelly. He broke away from the heat. Oh, he, James O'Kelly. I got gotcha. you. Okay. And he he and uh, Asbury got into a big fuss. Yes. And yeah. so he broke away and started his own religion. Yeah, I'm familiar <laughs> with I'm familiar with James O'Kelly. Uh, he should be, if he was actually licensed appropriately, it will be in Bang's book. I just don't remember anybody ever looking at that. Uh, a couple, somebody has published a fairly recent biography of James O'Kelly. I, I want to say it's a Kentucky book, but you might have seen that. Uh, somebody just did a, uh, a, a new book on James O'Kelly. I'll send you that if I can okay, find it. Okay, I don't title. know about that. I just... I've just been getting all these Methodist history books and, you know, yeah, they want to folk. They, they all say, you know, half of them say he was born in Ireland. Half of them say he was born in Virginia. They don't, nobody knows. And, but the, 
they have a specific marriage date. I mean, it just goes over and over and nobody knows where. Interesting. Well, I think with everything else, the, um, the, the fact that we have any answers, any questions that aren't answered in, in reality, let me say to remember this, the one thing I've learned in all these years, don't, if, if you follow the same path, if you look at the same things all the time, then you're not going to discover new information. You're going to find the same information you looked at the same time. You want to recheck those, but sometimes it's worth stepping out on the limb. You know, uh, hey, good old Oklahoma guy, Will Rogers, sometimes you have to, you have to step out on the limb because that's where the fruit is. You know, remember that one? So sometimes we've got to go out on the limb. We've got to go out in a different direction and look for uh, looking in different information because the new stuff is often somewhere else and we have access to so much. Just, just be patient and, and uh, keep trying. And again, once you develop something good, reuse it, but don't be afraid to look at new material and, and weigh it. And as Liz said, we can be the filter and, and use the salt appropriately. Uh, I would suggest you use a non-sodium one if your doctor has told you to cut back on sodium. <laughs> We're kind of all falling into that category more, more than in the past, perhaps. And Jay would tell me that too. Yeah. It's medical. She would tell me that too. So, Well, listen, folks, I really appreciate everybody joining us. And as always, if you have other questions that you'd like for Mark to answer, you can email him or, you know, contact him because his inf contact information is on those handouts. So, oh, he's going to put up some more pictures. Okay. Well, it's the same ones I had up while ago. Um, and I've got thousands. I'll get them all to Kathy. But yeah, you guys have my email. It's the same as in the handout. And and always, you know, feel free to email me and ask us information. And as I look through the pictures, I start looking at everybody and I see many of you here today and I appreciate it. And I want to say thanks to Kathy and to the Tulsa City County Library and all the genealogy friends for all these times of joining us and being with us because, um, hey, I don't know about you, but July's have always been special since I first came to Tulsa. So thank you guys. Don't forget everybody to fill out the survey and come and see us up at the library and Mark, we'll see you soon. All thank right, thanks you. Kathy. Bye. Bye.